On Wednesday, February 1st, 2012, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working a regular shift at the Common Grounds Espresso Coffee Stand on Tudor Street, Anchorage, Alaska. By the time it was 8 p.m. and already dark outside, the streets had gone silent and there were hardly any people around. As Samantha finished her shift, she was unaware that there was a predator lurking in the shadows of the narrow alleys that surrounded the area. Sadly, Samantha fell prey to this marauding man who abducted her at gunpoint. Who could have abducted Samantha? Welcome to Mysteria 7, where we shed light on under-the-radar cases from across the country. Today, we'll be looking into the insanely twisted and disturbing case of the mysterious abduction of Samantha Koenig. Now, without any further ado, let's dive into the case. Anchorage is a city in the state of Alaska, USA. It's known for its cultural sites, traditional crafts, and stage dances. Anchorage is a vibrant city with many positives, including its stunning scenery, no sales tax, and friendly community. However, the city also has its downsides. Anchorage has consistently been in the top 10 most dangerous cities in the U.S. Being Alaska's largest city, criminals enjoy the advantage of traveling through the area virtually undetected. The violent crime rate in Anchorage is more than double the national average of the U.S. And sadly, Samantha's life was cut short in the city of Anchorage when she was just 18. Samantha Koenig was born in Anchorage, Alaska on August 30, 1993. She was brought up in the same town by her parents, James Koenig and Darlene Christensen. James, Samantha's father, never knew he could love someone so much until the day Samantha was born. He would always stand by her side. He affectionately called her Honey Bunny. Samantha was full of life and had the biggest, most wonderful personality from her childhood, which she carried into her adulthood as well. She had an infectious charm and a brilliant sarcastic wit. Her desire was to work with animals, whether in the equestrian field or out in the wild. She was considering enlisting in the Navy to become a nurse and build a lucrative career. Her family was always proud and supportive of her. Samantha attended West High School and Avail High School, both in Anchorage. In 2011, when she was 17, she started dating a boy named Dwayne Tortellani II and was in a relationship with him. Samantha loved going fishing with her father and camping and playing Call of Duty with Dwayne, her boyfriend. She also had a keen interest in photography and in writing music and poetry. She'd worked at Subway and House of Harley, and by 2012, when Samantha was 18, she'd recently started working as a barista at a coffee stand named Common Grounds Espresso at 630 East on Tudor Street in her hometown of Anchorage. Sadly, this would be the last place she would be seen alive. At 8 p.m. on Wednesday, February 1, 2012, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was on her shift at Common Grounds Espresso, the coffee stand. Even as the night turned darker and the streets went quiet, Samantha stayed at the coffee shop, cleaning it up. Little did she know, a demon with prying eyes was just around the corner, looking for his next target. In the next few minutes, Samantha went missing, and that February night in 2012 became the last one anyone saw her alive. The same night, just a few hours after Samantha's abduction, Samantha's boyfriend Dwayne witnessed a man breaking into his truck. He feared that the man was trying to steal the truck and went inside his home to call for help. But by then, the man had fled, leaving the truck behind. Dwayne was unaware at the time that Samantha had been abducted. The night passed quietly as Samantha's loved ones went to their beds, not knowing of the tragedy that had already happened. Samantha wasn't reported missing until the next day when her parents failed to locate her or get in contact with her. The investigation into Samantha's disappearance was led by Jolene Godin, Jeff Bell, and Lieutenant Dave Parker. Even though it had been quite a few hours since Samantha was abducted, the detectives immediately descended on Anchorage, hoping to find the missing girl. They obtained surveillance footage from the Common Grounds Espresso coffee stand where Samantha was working on the night she disappeared. The footage showed an armed man wearing a black hoodie and possibly a baseball cap suddenly appearing at the coffee stand. He pointed a gun at Samantha, and soon, Samantha was seen turning off the lights of the coffee stand and walking out of it. Samantha and the man then walked toward the old Seaward Highway. 
Looking at Samantha's behavior and demeanor, the detectives figured that Samantha had been taken against her will and her case was ruled an abduction. After a thorough search of the coffee stand, the detectives found out that all the cash from the coffee stand was missing. At least two dozen detectives were put on the job to sort through leads in the case. Detectives and volunteers worked hand in hand, even through the nights in freezing temperatures, to search for Samantha. But their efforts were in vain. For more than two weeks, there weren't any signs of Samantha, and the detectives were finding it difficult to identify the man who took Samantha, as most of his face was covered. At a press conference, Samantha's father, James Koenig, offered a $12,500 reward for any information leading to Samantha's return. He hoped that this might make someone step forward with some information about his daughter or about the man who had kidnapped her. Further, James Koenig requested his daughter's kidnapper to send her home. He said that he would give the kidnapper anything they'd ask for. These people need to give my daughter back so we can get back with our lives. I will do anything. Take me. Within a few more days, Samantha's friends and families collected more donations to put toward the reward, and the reward was quickly increased to $41,000. We had people who were donating money, thousands of dollars. We had t-shirts made, pens made. We had people who were putting flyers throughout the state of Alaska. But sadly, nothing came of it, and the reward went unclaimed. During all this time, the police controversially refused to release the surveillance video of Samantha's abduction for reasons unknown. Surprisingly, after a few days, on February 24, 2012, a man texted Dwayne, Samantha's boyfriend, from her phone. Her boyfriend just goes sheet white. He's got his phone and there's a text from her phone. And told him to look for a package in a local park. When the detectives arrived at the park, they found a photo of Samantha. When you enter that park, there's a bulletin board, and tacked was a Ziploc bag that had what ultimately was a photograph of Samantha and a ransom note. The fact that there was a ransom note really ratchets up the tension because, okay, she's alive, and what are we gonna do to get her back? The photo, which was put up to prove that Samantha was alive, also had a note behind it in which Samantha's kidnapper demanded $30,000 to be deposited into Samantha's bank account. The proof of life picture convinced Samantha's parents that there was still hope and she could be saved. They now only wished that their daughter, Samantha, could return home safely. Up to that point, law enforcement, FBI, did not know this was Israel Keys. However, James, Samantha's father, noticed something odd in the picture that came with the ransom demand. To him, the photo looked weird because Samantha's hair was braided and she never wore it that way. Even though Samantha's father had an eerie suspicion about Samantha's picture, he got to work and made arrangements to gather the ransom money. As soon as Samantha's father came up with the money, he deposited the funds into the account that was linked to Samantha's debit card. While the money had been transferred, the detectives had a plan ready. They had worked out a deal with the bank so that Anchorage Police Department and the FBI would be notified immediately when the debit card was used for anything. They decided that their best course of action was to track the activity on Samantha's debit card. They assumed that the individual making any withdrawals from Samantha's account had to be her kidnapper. Perhaps this could lead them to a suspect. So a few days go by, and at this point, we have our first ATM withdrawal from Samantha's account. The detectives were successful in tracing the locations of the withdrawals, which were made after the money had been deposited into Samantha's account. There were three withdrawals in the city of Anchorage of $500, the daily limit. In all of the ATM situations where he was using the debit card, as soon as the alerts came, we dispatched law enforcement there as quickly as we could, but we were literally minutes behind him. But the kidnapper had made a mistake during one of his very first withdrawals. In addition to capturing a masked man, an ATM camera in Arizona had also captured a white Ford Focus, the car he was traveling in. This information was pushed out to law enforcement across the entire corridor, and a lookout bulletin was circulated for the suspect's car. As the detectives were able to track withdrawals from Samantha's account, they quickly deduced that her abductor had moved throughout the southwestern U.S. and was now traveling east along Interstate 10. Every patrol officer was now keeping a lookout for any cars matching the description of the kidnappers. It didn't take long for the police to find the kidnapper after that. There was a Texas Highway Patrol corporal, and he saw a white Ford Focus. 
He thought, this looks kind of like the car they're looking for. His car perfectly matched the description provided to the officers. He broke the speed limit by three miles per hour. And in Texas, that's a good traffic stop. So they stopped him. The man was asked to step outside his vehicle and show his driver's license. The police officer is handed an Alaska driver's license. He was identified as Israel Keys of Anchorage, Alaska. He seemed very relaxed. He was, yeah, he, there was nothing that stood out about him. I don't think he knew what we knew while we were talking to him. His vehicle was searched after officers spotted cash stained with bright ink. There's a gun in the trunk of the car as well. But the big thing is Samantha's cell phone and then Samantha's debit card is also recovered. When the ATM card was found, the decision to put him in a vehicle, secure him and take him to jail was instantaneously made. You know, the ball game is over. Keyes was immediately linked with Samantha's disappearance and was arrested on March 13th, 2012. He was transferred to be imprisoned at Anchorage Correctional Complex, Anchorage, Alaska. As the detectives took a deeper look into his past, they made some worrying discoveries. Israel Keyes was born in Richmond, Utah on January 7, 1978 to Heidi Keyes, Nay Hackinson, and John Jeffrey Keyes. He was the second of 10 children born to a large and devout Mormon family who were also anti-government and didn't believe in public school or modern medicine. In Keyes' childhood days, his parents were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from Torrance, California. There, Keyes and his siblings were homeschooled and taught Christian beliefs until 1983. After leaving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints faith, Keyes' father moved the family to a remote plot of land north of Colville, Washington in Stevens County when Israel was five years old. Isolated from society, the Keyes family lived in a one-room cabin located on Rocky Creek Road where they lived without electricity or running water. The Keyes family then moved to Colville where they attended services at a church called The Ark which practiced white supremacist Christian identity ideology. For some years, some of the Keyes' children had been forced to sleep in a tent due to their cabin's small size. To survive, the Keyes' children were made to hunt their food, chop firewood, and work on local farms to support the family. By his teenage years, Keyes had become a skilled and proficient carpenter. He also worked for a Colville contractor from 1995 to 1997. As a hobby, Keyes hunted anything with a heartbeat and once admitted to skinning a deer alive to his peers at the church. Soon thereafter, the family relocated to Smyrna, Maine. On one occasion, after an intense argument with his parents, Keyes declared his atheism to them. This led his parents to a victim from their residence. They then instructed his younger siblings, who looked up to their brother, to never have contact with him again. Keyes then developed an inordinate interest in Satanism. On July 9, 1998, Keyes relocated and enlisted in the United States Army in the state of New York where he served as a specialist in Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Infantry Regiment. He passed a rigorous month-long preliminary course for United States Army Rangers training. He was stationed at Fort Lewis and Fort Hood, as well as abroad in Egypt from 1998 through 2001. Keyes was also awarded an Army Achievement Medal for his meritorious service as a gunner and assistant gunner. In 2007, Keyes started a construction business in Alaska called Keyes Construction, after having worked as a handyman, contractor, and construction worker. And finally, by 2012, Keyes was living in Anchorage with his girlfriend and his 10-year-old daughter. While in custody for the murder, abduction, and assault on Samantha, Keyes was interviewed by local authorities and the FBI a number of times. He did not say anything about the kidnapping other than denying that he had anything to do with it. The suspect is identified as 34-year-old Israel Keyes, when they found him, we had no clue who this man was. Never seen his face before. Then it became, where is she? But authorities won't have any idea what happened to Samantha until they talk to Keyes face to face. Keyes finally confessed to the crime and revealed the details of the horrific night he abducted Samantha on. Whatever it takes to do that. The first thing we want to know, what everybody wants to know is, where's Samantha? Before he abducted Samantha from the coffee shop, he'd been stalking the area on Tudor Street for quite some time. He admitted to authorities that on the night of February 1st, 2012, he only planned to commit robbery. However, in the heat of the moment, he decided to kidnap Samantha. 
That night, just when it was almost eight in the evening, he walked up to the window of the coffee shop just prior to closing time, wearing a ski mask and ordering a coffee. Samantha made the coffee and handed it to Keyes, after which she pulled out a gun and pointed it at her. Keyes demanded cash from Samantha and ordered her to turn off the lights. The moment Samantha turned off the lights, Keyes jumped through the window, bound her hands, stuffed a handful of napkins in her mouth, and forced her out of the coffee stand. Samantha broke away from Keyes and tried to run away. Keyes chased her and tackled her to the ground. He put one arm around her and pointed a gun at her body with the other hand, telling her that she needed to cooperate. He said that the gun had a silencer and that she should not do anything to make him kill her. They walked across Tudor Road into the parking lot between the IHOP restaurants and Dairy Queen, where Keyes' white pickup truck was parked. Keyes had previously prepared a truck for the abduction by taking the mounted toolbox off the bed of the truck as well as removing the license plates. Keyes then bound Samantha in the truck and drove away. While driving Samantha to his house, he told her that he only wanted to hold her for ransom. On the way, Keyes realized that Samantha did not have her cell phone or debit card on her. He needed both to procure the ransom. Keyes returned to the coffee stand, found Samantha's phone, and sent her family and friends texts to avert suspicion. Keyes then placed Samantha in his shed at his home, tying her up by the neck. Samantha told Keyes that her debit card was in her boyfriend's truck. Keyes drove to Samantha's boyfriend's residence and stole the card out of the vehicle. This was when Dwayne, Samantha's boyfriend, actually witnessed the theft but was unable to prevent Keyes from fleeing the scene. At that time, Dwayne was unaware that this burglary had a connection with his girlfriend. After he came back to his house in the later hours of that same night, Keyes went inside to check on his daughter and girlfriend and make sure they were asleep. He poured himself a glass of wine and returned to the shed. He had a shed in his driveway, and ultimately he put Samantha in the shed, and she's bound in the shed. There he was drinking alcohol and smoking cigars, and then turned up the music so that any sounds that were irregular wouldn't be heard by his girlfriend, daughter, who were in the house, or the neighbors. Once Keyes knew he had access to Samantha's card, he realized that he didn't need Samantha alive anymore. Keyes told Samantha how he would assault her before strangling her to death with the rope he had already tied around her neck. And that's exactly what he did. Keyes mercilessly strangled Samantha as she gasped for air till there was no life left in her. He left her body in the shed, went back to his house, and packed his and his daughter's bags. The morning after the kidnapping, Israel Keyes rolled her body up and stuck it in a box in his shed, and then woke his girlfriend up and his child up, went to New Orleans, boarded a cruise ship, and then came back about two, two and a half weeks later. Keyes returned from his vacation on February 17th, 2012. He'd left Samantha's body to freeze inside the shed for that entire duration. Although Samantha had been dead at that time, Keyes figured he could still get a ransom from her family. Because of the cold temperatures, she had frozen, and then he thawed her out and had to apply makeup to her in order to make her look more lifelike. And also, he told detectives he braided her hair as he had braided his daughter's hair and taken her photograph to be used in the ransom note, not knowing that she never wore her hair that way. Keyes took Samantha's body and attempted to make her look alive. He sewed her eyes open with a fishing line and put makeup on her face. In addition, he braided her hair, propped her body up against a wall, and held out a recent issue of the Alaska Daily News in front of her. Keyes then took a Polaroid of Samantha as proof of life, typed a $30,000 ransom on the back of that photo, and placed it at a local park on February 24, 2012. He then used Samantha's phone to text Dwayne, Samantha's boyfriend, to provide instructions on what to do next. As more grisly details about Samantha's murder unfolded, the detectives were left distraught. What disturbed them the most was the fact that when Keyes took Samantha's picture as proof of life, she was not alive. All that time after the detectives received the picture and started looking for Samantha with the hope that she was still alive, Samantha was already long gone. Later, Keyes also confessed that he dismembered Samantha's body and disposed of the remains in the Matanuska Lake just outside of Palmer, Alaska, to the north. It was confirmed that Samantha was killed on February 1st, 2012, 
the same night she was abducted in Anchorage, Alaska. Samantha was merely 18 years old. Her body was discovered on April 2, 2012, just a few days after Keyes confessed to the crime. The day after his full confession, the FBI dispatches their cold water dive team. Special Agent Bobby Chacon is tapped to lead the recovery efforts. It's still late winter in Anchorage, and the conditions we're going to be operating under are extreme. We get to Lake Mananuska, and some FBI agents, they're kind of standing watch over a spot on the lake that Keyes had directed them to. There was a fishing hole that was frozen over. I looked at that, and I said, if she's here, we're going to find her. Keyes spent seven months behind bars speaking to the authorities about his double life and his previous crimes. He confessed to being a serial killer, assaulter, arsonist, burglar, and bank robber. The earliest crime to which Keyes admitted was the violent assault of a teenage girl who'd been tubing with her friends down the Deschutes River in Maupin, Oregon, sometime between 1996 and 1998. Originally, he'd planned to murder her as a part of a satanic ritual, but he let her go in the river tube he'd abducted her from. He believed that he was too timid and not violent enough back then. After this incident, he promised himself that he was never going to let that happen again. By that, he meant he was not going to let any of his victims survive. Although several of his victims remained unnamed, besides Samantha, it was discovered that he killed Bill and Lorraine Courier, a married couple that lived in Vermont. Keyes broke into their home in June 2011. He then drove the couple to an abandoned farmhouse where he shot Bill and strangled Lorraine. Additionally, Keyes disclosed that he'd assaulted Lorraine before he murdered her. Their bodies were never found. If Keyes hadn't confessed to the crime, it might have never been solved. The detectives found out that there were warning signs when it came to Keyes' behavior in his early years. In an interview with investigators, Keyes stated that he was 14 when he realized that there were things which he thought were normal, but nobody else seemed to think the same way about those things. This included torturing animals and stealing guns from people's homes. The detectives were quick to observe that Keyes was not an ordinary serial killer. He went to great lengths and took various precautions to avoid being detected. This included traveling around the country, burying murder kits, and paying for everything in cash. He'd leave murder kits hidden in various places around the U.S. with things like weapons, tools, and cash in them in order to not have to travel with items that may seem conspicuous. Additionally, he chose his victims randomly. He didn't have a particular type when it came to choosing his victims. Keyes was more of an opportunist than a planner. Once he killed someone somewhere, he never returned to that area ever again, which allowed him to disappear without consequence. When asked why he killed all those people, he simply replied to the authorities, why not? After conducting many interviews with Keyes, the detectives believed that he felt no remorse for what he did and killed because he got an immense amount of enjoyment out of it. I think in his words, he said, you got your monster. <laughs> Keyes, however, did admit that he was careless in Samantha's murder, which is what got him caught. Samantha was his last victim. Samantha's life brought many communities around the world together. Her story touched the hearts of many, from family and friends to complete strangers. She'll be missed by many and lives on in everyone's hearts forever. Samantha was cremated at sunrise on Easter Sunday, April 8, 2012. The celebration of Samantha's life attended by her loved ones, was held on Sunday, April 22, 2012, in the afternoon at West High School Auditorium. In lieu of mourning for Samantha, her family solicited everyone to keep Samantha in their thoughts by sharing a smile and a laugh with those they encountered. In May 2012, Keyes tried to escape from a courtroom after breaking his leg irons during a routine hearing. Fortunately, his escape attempt was unsuccessful and authorities restrained him again. On December 2, 2012, when Keyes was 34 years old and still being held in custody awaiting his trial for the murder of Samantha Koenig, he took his own life. He'd managed to conceal a razor blade in his cell and used this to commit the act. A note found under his body consisted of an ode to Samantha's murder. The letter also had 11 skulls drawn on it with his own blood labeled, We Are One. Officials suspected this alluded to the total number of Keyes' unnamed victims. But neither their identities nor clues as to where their remains could be found were revealed in the note. A small funeral for the 34-year-old was held in Valley Hillside Cemetery, Washington, where he was buried days after his death. His mother and his sisters attended the service, conducted by their pastor, Jake Gardner. 
Most of the FBI interrogations conducted on Keyes were released publicly in 2018. It was believed that he had at least 11 victims. One of these confirmed kills was Samantha Koenig, the one who led the police to his capture. But by the time he encountered Samantha Koenig, he'd already killed up to 10 people in multiple states, such as Washington, New York, Vermont, and Florida. The FBI also released writings found in Israel Keyes' jail cell when he took his own life. The writings, a combination of pencil and ink on a yellow legal pad, were discovered beneath Keyes' body, illegible and covered in blood. Because of their initial condition, the writings were sent to the FBI laboratory in Virginia for processing. The FBI concluded that there was no hidden code or message in the writings. Further, it was determined that the writings did not offer any investigative clues or leads as to the identity of other possible victims. The FBI did not offer any commentary as to the meaning of these writings. Jolene Godin, the detective who led the investigation in Samantha's case, said that apart from Samantha and Bill and Lorraine Courier, Keyes discussed seven or eight other victims. She and her team are working hard every day to identify those people. Investigators believe that Keyes killed and buried a victim in upstate New York in April 2009. The detectives are working with law enforcement around the country to link Keyes to other open cases as well. Do you think Israel Keyes was connected to any more murders than the 11 that he was already linked with? Israel also had a girlfriend and a daughter. Do you think they had any idea about Israel's double life? Did they really never see any disturbing signs, or did they just ignore them? Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.